You're listening to the official podcast of Asbury University, produced by students with God-honoring conversations that inform, edify, and encourage. This is Asbury. We explore culture and current topics through a Christian worldview, promoting a well-balanced life, and we empower our community to belong, become, and be set apart. I'm your host, Abby Lobb. Welcome to This is Asbury. guest host, Paul Nesselrode. I chair the psych department here at Asbury, and I also direct our honors program. Our guest this morning is author, professor, and speaker, Dr. Brandon Rickabaugh. He serves as an assistant professor of philosophy at Palm Beach Atlantic University. His work is on the nature of consciousness and what that has to say about a whole set of things, including reality, ourselves as persons, and personhood itself as well as what our consciousness has to say about the relationship between technology and spiritual formation. He's on campus to speak at the fall conference gathering of the Christian Scientific Society. A video of this second talk can be eventually found on the Honors website. He also has a book coming out just days after this recording entitled The Substance of Consciousness. And this book has been co-authored with philosopher J.P. Moreland. What brought you to the topic of consciousness and especially the sort of the relationship between our technological devices and spiritual development? My mentor, Moreland and then Dallas Willard, both of them think that consciousness is a really fundamental aspect of reality that sort of runs life. And I think, you know, they convinced me of that. And then my other interests in how do we know reality, what unifies us as persons, what unifies us with God and each other, I think all of those kind of come together in the nature of what consciousness is. And so I kept finding myself coming back to consciousness. And I think that's the same also with larger cultural issues that we're facing right now. What is a person? So much of everything going on right now comes down to what is or is not a person. And then take that with the formational aspect in Christ of becoming the kind of person that Jesus is, and then asking the questions of, well, what are the biggest stumbling blocks to culture, in culture, in the church and outside of the church? And technology seems to be, I would want to say, like the biggest medium for that right now. Interesting. So it's sort of mentoring and academic investigation as opposed to some crisis experience in your life or things like that. It really was just pursuing ideas. I think so, but in the background, there's always this, you know, I grew up in a largely agnostic home, but I grew up surfing, and so I think just people that grow up surfing have this spiritual, you know, you're out in the water, it's obvious you're not in control of things. So I was always just, you know, what am I? Who am I? So that phenomenological exploration, I think, has always been in the background, and that takes you to consciousness. Could you share the main points of your lecture on the relationship between spiritual formation, well, process of spiritual formation in this age? So one thing to make clear that we don't talk about a lot is just what is technology? And it turns out that conversation's really, really old. Plato had arguments about how just the written word changes us in terms of our capacities to memorize things. And so there's always been this question about what is technology and and how does it affect us and how do we use it to affect other things. And so technology, you could say, is not altogether neutral. Once it's created or our process of creating it comes into the world with these normative demands. And so it's going to have to be then the case that it's going to impact us as persons. And the process of spiritual formation is one that's guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit, a person. So it's deeply interpersonal. Technology advances now into digital technology, becomes more and more depersonal, more and more subversive. And it affects, so then it affects the way that we grow, what we're formed or malformed in Christ or in ourselves. So there's that move. And then next is to say that much of what our life is about and becomes is in virtue of what we give our attention to. So one way to check what you really love or what you find your safety in is where does your mind go? What is your attention drawn to? Scriptures often place your mind on things above. Knowing God is what Jesus talks about is constituting salvation in John 17, 3. 
And as it turns out, the economy right now, the greatest resource, the greatest commodity is our attention. And that's exactly where technology fits in. And so you have literally this fundamental sort of warfare, you could think about it, over your attention, drawn to Christ, drawn to self. So it's, I think technology just brings on these natural Gethsemane moments, dying to self or living you know, for self in virtue of technology. And I don't think technology is all bad, but I think that we're very late to the game. We're developing things that we don't understand. We're sort of guinea pigs in our own experiment, and it's harming us spiritually. Oh, well, that's fantastic. We just riff off of that actually for quite some time. Oh, yeah. But I will resist. I was just thinking about it just seems how the technology always raises the stakes. Mm-hmm. There's always challenges, but then the technology and that can be used for unimagined good, but can also be used for unimagined bad prior to that technology coming about. Oh, that's right. Yeah, fascinating. One of the points I'll make is that Technology is just an extension of your powers. And so you could think that the fig leaves might be one of the first cases of technology. And it's used to draw Adam and Eve's attention away from what they don't want to attend to. I want to grab something you mentioned in a talk. I think it was your talk at Westmont where I heard you say something like, we know we are valued, but we can't explain it because we see ourselves as mechanisms. And guess by mechanisms as opposed to persons, if I'm reading into that. So if I can just develop this a little bit more, it resonated with me. I've considered that the identity issues that we're wrestling with these days, they're so challenging, are only secondarily, I think, perhaps about gender, about race, about ethnicity, sexual orientation, other demographics. More primarily, the identity question has to do with who we are as humans. As you say, we feel valued, but we don't know in what that feeling is ultimately grounded. This is me talking now. So I want to bounce this off you and you tell me if I'm on the right track. We seem to be looking at features of our body, our community, or desires within ourselves, but perhaps we haven't fully taken on board the idea that intrinsic value implies a value giver. That is a person who is, in a way, on the outside, bestowing it, assigning it. Am I on the right track here? I think that's right. Our value, that God attributing it to us, has created us teeming with value. And this is why sin is so horrible, because it's marring someone and cultures that are very brilliant and beautiful. It, that's why it's a tragedy. What happens to a rock, not so tragic. It's what it gets used for in terms of harming a person that makes it a tragedy. And so I think that that's right. These issues about identity at one level or another ground out in this sense of understanding that we are important. But what's hard about that is that the search for importance puts this moral demand on us where we recognize our importance doesn't really come from ourselves. It can be found in some self-discovery. It can be found in community. But those aren't the sources of it. And when you're morally confronted by that, when you come to know that you are not of this world, so to speak. That's scary and you've got to deal with something because knowledge always brings accountability. So then the easiest way to get away from that is to look at human persons as things that are malleable. You can alter it based on how you want the world to be. And then that will extend itself out to our desire to manipulate how others see us and how we want them to be seen. And so we further outsource our humanity by turning it into a politic or a commodity, or a slogan. Technology lets us hide further and further away from other people behind you know, Twitter, for example. So much easier to harm someone when you're so far removed from them digitally. Their humanity is not made present to us, or the way Levinas would say is, I'm not presented with the face of the other that brings this moral demand. And so I think you're right. I think returning back to humanity is going to be the best way to work out all these other things that we're talking. I'm very concerned that the way that we're having the discussion is really, really harmful. Mm -hmm. I would think, too, that it's a better way to interpret where our culture is at. Instead of thinking that our problem is more and more secularization or more and more disenchantment, I think it's really more and more dehumanization through the process of technological development. That's the core of any secularization that goes on. Even in the midst of the mantra of individual liberties and freedoms and being the you you could never have been in previous generations, that's really fascinating to think about. There's a potential irony and I don't want to put too many words to it, but mystery and sort of a fun, it's just what a shame to have so missed, to so fundamentally miscalculated where the real weight of our conversation should be placed today. I would think of it less 
about secularization and more as a development of heresy in the sense of a constant rejection or moving away from core Christian ideas. Yeah, because there's so much fear about broadly defined secularism. It seems to perhaps take our minds off of more fundamental questions we should be asking about ourselves and our experiences. And the activity of God. Dallas Willard would say, I'm not sure there is such a thing as a secular society. Show me one place where God isn't active. Let's get to your book. So you've authored a book with J.P. Moreland. It's entitled The Substance of Consciousness with a subtitle, Defense of Contemporary Substance Dualism. And so I want to give some time to this too. I haven't read it at the time of this recording. It's yet to be released. It's getting a lot of favorable press. Maybe you could briefly tell us what is substance dualism and why does it need defending to go right at your title there? It turns out that the sociology or the psychology of the cognitive science of religion shows that the vast majority of people have all believed intuitively across socioeconomic and historical divides, including self uh, culture, cultures that self-identify as atheists, have all recognized that they are not identical to their body or any part of their body. That's not to say that their body isn't important. I think that's very obvious. But it is to say that who or what I am fundamentally is not a physical thing. And so the substance dualist wants to say, just in the most basic sense, I'm a person, I'm a substance that has features, and that substance is not physical, it's immaterial. And my body stands in some special relation to that. And that's an open question on the view that Moreland and I have or work out and defend. It's more neo-Aristotelian where the body is an inseparable part of you in the sense that you become disembodied and you don't your body's gone you don't see that your body is an ensouled thing your soul is what makes a body a body and unlives it so they're actually on this view a very very tight unity between the person and their body which often substance dualism is taught in the opposite strain but if you look at the history of substance dualism and particular thinkers they think quite the opposite but it needs to be defended now because there are maybe a prevailing dominant, you can choose the word, a belief that really it all does sift down to a physical substrate and there's really nothing else there. And that can be, in the minds of some, even faithful, some can be made to fit with a Christian understanding as well. Can we That's right. tease that apart or help us understand that a little bit? The book is a project that Moreland and I worked on over three and a half years on, and so obviously we thought it was important. And again, it comes down to this issue of consciousness and the person. We think this is the fundamental debate. And you're right, the loudest voices at least contend that we are identical to or made up of purely physical things. And if you apply that to society or if you apply that to psychology, for example, you end up coming out with some pretty bad results in terms of how we live. So we think that there's real existential substance that's at stake and that also it's becoming very, very prominent among certain well-known Christian theologians and psychologists. In all the literature on this, it's just assumed that substance dualism is false. There have not been very sophisticated arguments made against the view and there's almost no or very little attention paid to contemporary defenders of the view. And actually what's happening right now is very interesting in that a new group of non-religious philosophers of mind and philosophers of consciousness and neuroscientists are rejecting the view that we're identical to a physical thing and that physical things is just the fundamental and that everything will be explained by physics mm -hmm. to another view where consciousness has to be fundamental. So what's happening is there's this move, I don't want to say towards substance dualism, but it's moving in that direction. It's an opportune time, just in terms of the ideas and the debates and where the evidence is going. And so we wanted to pour our time into that, attending both to the philosophy and the neuroscience. Interesting. So am I to gather that this, for lack of a better term, monism, maybe I'm not using that term technically, but this idea of one stuff that's really kind of new, is it sort of an optimism of the advances of naturalistic science in the last 200 years? You have this trend of materialism going back to pre-Socratic philosophers. So historically, if you just look at the development of psychology and the cognitive sciences out of the mid-1800s, you start to get this move, and then certainly in the early 1900s where psychology wants to be part of the natural sciences. And in particular, this move was towards behaviorism initially that, look, if uh, what the sciences study are just quantitative facts in terms of, you know, mass and 
you know, velocity, position, and, and weight, and these sorts of things. And so what do we do? Well, we can't look at the soul because that's introspection. We got to look at behavior. So initially, it was tied to the advancement of sciences. And then behaviorism fails as both a psychological project, a research project, and then also as a philosophical project. But then neuroscience seems to take really, really big steps. And the issue then was that if we can keep explaining more and more of human phenomena in terms of neuroscience, then the soul loses its explanatory power. The issue, though, is, is whether or not neuroscience can make good on that. And when I did a year-long fellowship to study neuroscience, I found out that most neuroscience, at least all the neuroscientists that I interact with, are not even interested in the question of consciousness. They're interested in other, you know, you get research grants to produce pharmaceuticals, one big project there. It's not interested in consciousness so much. Part of it is because the studies on consciousness always leave out consciousness. It always goes back to behavior. The report of someone feeling of disgust when they see an image, and that correlates with an fMRI reading of a particular brain state. All we keep getting are correlations. We get some causation, but we certainly don't get identity or the nature of consciousness. So it's a promissory note that naturalism is making that we'll figure it out. But I don't think that the neuroscience itself is what is undergirding the rejection of dualism, but more so, you know, the natural sciences are going to figure it all out. Then theologians come along and, well, we don't want to be late to the game on this. Against that, there's a book I haven't read yet by an English neuroscientist, McGilchrist, if you're familiar with Ian McGilchrist, who argues there's limits to materialism. And I don't think he's coming at this from a Christian perspective, although I think he's sympathetic to metaphysics that would allow that. But he seems to be pointing us towards a reality that's grounded in relationships, of which matter is a means by which we relate to one another, but matter is not the whole show. And he does, perhaps why his book has made such a big splash is because it does seem to push against this lack of even contemplation of the issue by so many in the neuroscience. And then I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. John Lennox a bit ago. He talks about a, a word-based universe, which mm -hmm. I think is getting at this as well. There's nothing but matter here. Mm -hmm. And that actually maybe matter is subservient to larger purposes, which has got to be difficult for the materialist to even contemplate. I think that's right. And one of the big problems that philosophers of mind have known is difficult to solve is just the issue of what is matter. You might just point to things and say, well, that's matter, that's material, whatever that is. You've got this issue about, well, matter is whatever physics studies. But the problem is, is that in the history of physics, we know that those things become stranger and stranger and stranger. And we also know that our physics right now is incomplete. And so that tells us that what physics is going to study in the future is going to be different. And so our conception of matter is going to have to be different. And so we can't use physics today to tell us, well, that is what matter is. And we've got competing and changing conceptions of that. But it does seem clear of what consciousness is. It's the background of everything that I experience. Every experiment that I do, whatever evidence I gain through that is going to be something that I have an awareness of, that I have a conscious experience of. So it seems, one, my understanding of what consciousness is, maybe not how it works, but that's much clearer than what matter is. But then, two, the way that matter shows up in the world in certain ways seems to be based on what minds do with it. So talk about, you know, words or what information is. Words get their intention from minds. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of This is Asbury. To learn more about Asbury University, visit asbury.edu.